Among the first significant experiments in computer animation is the New York Institute of Technology's Sunstone by Alvy Ray Smith and Ed Emschwiller. It marked a new development in computer capability, that of creating multi-dimensional movement. Pacific Data Images produced the teddy bear Maelstrom. This computer film by Art Dorinsky and Glenn Entis was a breakthrough in multi-dimensional animation. It has created movement within movement. The images and the sequences into which they are built up become many layered. Bob Abel, another explorer of untrodden computer territory, is head of Robert Abel and Associates. Uh, I get asked a lot about the relationship between art and technology because somehow or another we've been able to master the two. And when I was a youth, technology was everything. My parents' dream was to send me to engineering school. And I went to engineering school, lasted two weeks, quit, and it took me another two weeks to get enough courage to tell them that I had left. And in that part of my life, just a young freshman in college, I just said, technology out, art in. There was no room for that in my life. And when I got to be a senior at UCLA, I wound up getting a job with John Whitney Sr. And he had mastered a camera system which was being run by an old World War II anti-aircraft device. And I stood in the dark because the lights would go out and the camera would be moved and the art would be repositioned by this computer and then the light strobe would go on. This is 1959. And I'd say, wow. That's incredible, and I think suddenly I had this emotional experience that it was like the 60s, 70s light show, but it was years ahead of its time. This man is on to something really special, and I, I, I really kind of put myself, he was my guru, and I, I, I laid myself in front of him and said, how do you do this? And slowly I began to understand what he did, and I used to run his camera at night, and I thought, if I could only get these two things together, and I've been working now the last 14 years, to try and get all of this, all this together. And I realized that the problem with animation and with art was that people saw art as art or technology as technology and technicians ran the engineering part of it and the artists didn't get to meddle in it. So we very stubbornly went out and built a computer about 14 years ago for about $1,500 and we figured out a way to do it. And it all came back to the fact my wife couldn't stand the fact that I would disappear and forget time. And so that that was a long time ago, but we realized that we had a powerful tool. Kubrick had opened the door with 2001. Whitney had been the pioneer way on the horizon very early. Lucas had popularized it in the mid-70s, and suddenly we found ourselves in the mid-70s with, with this backlog of other people's work and the work we had done for 7-Up and Levi's, and people were banging down our door. And in a sense, we've never looked back, and I thought, God, if I'd never run into John Whitney Sr., I never would have discovered all this. So. We just keep working away believing that, in a sense, the combination is a new language and that everybody's going to have to learn to speak it, but at least everybody will learn to hear it and to see it in the future. Even in the year 3000, the question will be, what's for dinner? Bob Abel produced a remarkably innovative commercial, and this is how it came about. But first you should know that animators begin the first stage of their work with what they call a storyboard. And a rather simple board of eight frames to tell a very simple story of what's for dinner. When we saw this board, uh, I said, we've got to do this board because, and, and at the same time I'm saying this, I'm scared because I don't know if we can do the board. So this, you know, this is a classic story of a commercial that can't and shouldn't be made. But it's like the little engine that could. And we're going to do it. Well, people have a preconceived idea of what computer <laughs> commercials look like. And this is going to break out of all of those molds. I mean, it's a real step. It's a quantum leap as far as commercials. Uh, the reason we chose Randy Roberts to direct this thing was that Randy has done so much work that we always thought was impossible, and he always proved us wrong. Yeah, it's this kind of detail, this you know, early space vehicle. Yeah, because it kicks light up well. I and mean, that's another thing we'll have to experiment with is, is the way some of these surfaces 
are affected by light. The first step was to translate that two-dimensional image that we see on the storyboard into one that works in three dimensions in the computer. And that takes a lot more redesign than it looks at, at first glance because we had to build the robot and her environment in pieces. It means everything from the smallest finger joint to the torso, to the neck, to the body parts, the leg, the arm, 18 pieces had to be put together and created for the computer. This entire image really never existed outside the computer itself. Once we had the design, we used a foam mannequin to give real shape to the robot. The foam was sliced into cross sections and each outline was then programmed and fed digitally into the computer and stored as information. Randy invented a technique he called brute force animation. We filmed a live model and programmed her choreographed movements into the computer. The computer tracked reference points painted on her body and created a stick figure animation which we call a vector graphic. Once we got the motion right, we used raster graphics to give the image form and color. The robot, her movements, the details, each reflection, the magic she does with the food, getting all of that into an environment and then adding Jupiter into the picture window. Well, that's millions of bits of information that the computer has to chew through. If you can imagine, each picture of film, which is a 24th of a second, takes 10,000 or 20,000 add, multiply, subtracts, divides. And on top of this, we're writing new software on a daily basis to speed this up. You get an idea that we're combining some science and technology with the ultimate in improvisation. Uh, what happened here? What, is this a that's, reflection? That's before the reflection uh, program was fixed. Okay, so this is a composite frame that we've already... Well, the thing that holds oh, up is the cool. joints. That's why this was... Naturally, we're incredibly proud of the results. But you get so close to, a, to an actor or to a performance, or in this case, to our friend that we called Sexy Robot, that we and the Catchem Advertising Group just held our breath as we showed it to the client. Even in the year 3000, the question will be, what's for dinner? The answer will be in a package that saves energy, nutrients, and trouble. A package that can last the three-year journey to Jupiter and back and back. Even in the year 3000, we see the brilliance of food in cans. I keep running across the word, John Hallis has said, a technophobia, a fear of the computer and the whole computer process. And artists, like myself, originally were terribly afraid of it. And I think the only way we're going to break it, and now we're on the other side, and I, I think we have to take the attitude of kind of a Joan of Arc, if we will, of the 20th century. Uh, we're out there and we're kind of religious zealots and, and, and we've got to, to get people to understand that this thing won't bite, it won't hurt them. And in fact, uh, this old word is overused, uh, user-friendly, because it's not. It requires a lot of time and patience and skill. But so does mastering a car. We know we get in a car because we got to get from A to B, and A to B is too far, and we, nobody goes on a horse anymore. So we've learned to master the car, which is as equally a complicated a tool. As artists, we've got to be go, able to go out there and say, look how simple it is to use. Here, touch this, look at this, feel this. And once we develop software, which we have, that is user-friendly and allow people the ability to say, look, there is no such thing as failure because none of us as adults want to fail. We want to be successful. We're a successful artist. We don't want something to come along and say, no, stop, you failed, you're miserable. See, I knew you couldn't do it. There is no such thing as failure. And if we go back to the Joan of Arc analogy, in a sense, we're out there right with Joan of Arc and we have a great advantage because she didn't have hot and cold running water. And, and, and we've got all of these wonderful luxuries. So. We just go out there and, and, and there's a saying that I've heard and I've, it's stuck with me. Thelonious Monk, the jazz musician, said it. Sure, I take risks. The best and most important musicians play tunes. They take risks. Sometimes I play tunes I've never even heard. <laughs>